uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you are in the world. We welcome you to today's uh, webinar titled, How to Introduce the Decision Model to Your Organization Successfully, brought to you by Knowledge Partners International, the thought leader in the field of business process management, decision modeling, and requirements. I'm Michael Gross, and I will be your moderator today, and uh, I would like to move on and introduce our today's presenter. Many of you may have met her in person or attended one of her webinars previously. Barbara von Halle is uh, one of the managing partners and founders and, and the founder of Knowledge Partners International. She is co-inventor of the decision model and co-author of the book The Decision Model, a business logic framework linking business and technology published by Taylor and Francis in 2009. She is the fifth recipient of the Outstanding Individual Achievement Award from Data Management International, also known as DEMA, the premier organization for data professionals worldwide, which introduced, inducted uh, Barbara into its Hall of Fame in 1995. She is an early pioneer in data architecture and business rules. Barbara authors a regular decision model column in www.tdan.com and www.modernanalyst.com and serves as a QA as consultant on Sapiens decision software and decision modeling and requirements projects. Her first book, Handbook of Relational Database Design, has sold over 21,000 copies and most likely a few more today. She was the most popular contributor to database programming and design magazine for years. She, uh, today she continues to impact the development of the decision model in collaboration with KPI and its clients. And please welcome uh, Barbara von Halle. Barbara, thank you for, for coming today and we're all excited about your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um, First of all, I just wanted to let you both know that this webinar is offered the, for the second time. We've offered it before, and it is back um, by popular demand. Um, it is meant for those of you who are looking for the best way to introduce the decision model into your organization. And um, what I will present will be a general outline that comes from the collective experience of both our clients and our partnering companies. And so these are organizations that have had success in introducing the decision model. And you might be wondering if you are the right person or the proper organizational position to be introducing the decision model. And um, hopefully you won't be surprised to learn that the decision model is adopted by different organizations in different ways. So there are many different paths for introducing it. Um, there are three common paths, and probably each of you is um, appropriate for one of those paths. So the, the first one I'll mention right now it is a high-level path by which the decision model is introduced through an existing center of excellence. So if you are a member of an ex a center of excellence such as business process modeling center, or project management center, or enterprise architecture, that's sometimes the way the decision model comes into an organization. Another high-level path is um, the decision model coming in in response to a business crisis or opportunity for which no other solution seems to work. And um, we have actually had that experience in several situations where they had tried all different other things, whether it be business rules approaches or technology uh, or different ways of modeling business processes. And we came in with our standard uh, decision aware business processes and the decision model and were able to solve some crises. Um, but there are less visible paths. For example, most often the decision model enters because there's been one inspired individual who creates decision models for a project and starts to socialize them among the organization. And often this is a group of business analysts or requirements developers working on a particular project. So no matter whether you're doing it from a center of excellence or from a crisis or challenge or, or a, from a project by project basis, um, they all start with one question. And the one question is, how do you introduce the decision model into an organization? But more specifically, how do you gain management attention for delivering decision models as a standard practice? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Here, so on the agenda is um, 
the, for this webinar is how to spread the word. I'm going to start with how to spread the word in terms of what other organizations are doing first. And um, so we do find that the key ingredient in spreading the word is to c create a concise, practical management presentation. But what's important about this presentation is that it must include a decision model that you prepared ahead of time based on a current or a past project so that you can explain how your organization used to uh, manage and organize and collect its business rules and how that changes when you use the decision model. And I'm going to give you some examples for that. Because nothing helps an audience grasp a new concept like the decision model as much as showing precisely and simply how it applies directly to something that they are familiar with and possibly something that they're struggling with. And your decision model then will solidify the tangible advantages of the decision model because you'll walk them through conversations and saying, how is it working today? Now that I've showed you the decision model, do you, which of these problems do you think or challenges seem to disappear and get better? And get your, your audience engaged in that conversation, even possibly write these things on, on a flip chart in terms of what their questions are and what advantages they see. So the idea is that the decision model that you create will be the beginning of a shift in business uh, responsibility, business governance, and business um, energy about the collection of business rules and business logic. So you need to do some homework. Your first task is to establish credibility for the decision model um, based on outside your organization. And there are two parts to this. The first is to prove that the decision model is working and has been proven in the real world, potentially in your same industry, but if you can't find an example in your same industry, something close to that. Um, and for this, you can seek testimonials, either from articles or links, or even from our web page. So let's look at um, a sample testimonial, which we are very proud of. Um, this page holds a testimonial from the SVP and CIO of Freddie Mac. We became engaged at Freddie Mac around the year 2008. Um, so that was an interesting time. Um, and this is the significant impact that the decision model has had on Freddie Mac's ability specifically to respond to Storm Sandy. And because um, they had a set of policy mortgage uh, or mortgage policies and changes as a result of that disaster and previous disasters, and they were able to respond to the Storm Sandy changes in 90% less time than they have been able to handle previous disasters, and that number is significant. Um, so you can, and they were able to do that because they used the decision model instead of other approaches, and because they used um, software that supported the decision model, uh, the Sapiens decision product that actually can validate the model, generate test cases, and test the model before going to IT, and in many cases can even generate code. And so you can use this testimonial if you like, or you can look for other ones, and you can use it in the opening of your presentation or in the closing of your presentation. We'll get to your presentation in a little bit. The second part of establishing credibility is an exciting um, announcement to state today, and that is that the IT standards group called the OMG has established as of September that decision modeling is an accepted practice in an emerging software marketplace. So this page describes the goal of DMN, or decision model and notation, as being a notation for decision logic that's understandable by all business users. And the whole concept of the DMN was instigated after we gave a presentation around 2007 um, on the decision model, and we came back a second time to the OMG. So as a result of what our model was and the experience and success we were having, the OMG decided that it needed to address this potentially as a standard. And um, the emphasis of the decision model notation standard is to aim for interchangeable decision models from a technology perspective. So we're very excited about this, that we'll be able to exchange decision models done in the decision model form with um, the DMN standard and products that support that. Uh, the D the DMN submission team is very significant. It boiled down to one team, and companies that joined that team and played a pivotal role in the new standard coming out include IBM, Oracle, and TIBCO. So 2014 is going to be a very interesting year for decision modeling. And in fact, what's exciting about this webinar is the press release 
by the OMG about the DMN is, is scheduled to be released this month. I believe the press release will appear next week. Um, so in terms of credibility, you can look at what other organizations are doing and have gone public with the decision model. And if you're coming at it from a technology perspective, you can use the OMG as a place to get yourself into the technology or enterprise architecture area to say, this was new last year, but now there's experience, now there's a standard, now everybody is going to be learning about this, and we are not the only company doing this. So um, that's really exciting for us. So the basic presentation to, that you should um, invite managers and different people in your organization to should have roughly these five parts and should take about one hour. So the first part is where you establish the credibility that we just went to. Um, and part two begins by reviewing for the audience how your organization currently manages business rules. And I will give you some ideas and some examples on what our clients have done there. And Part three is a brief introduction to the decision model, but you don't have to go into great detail because what you're going to do is show them their stuff in decision model format, and that's where it's really going to make sense to them. So you can make it a very brief um, presentation. Part four is where you really introduce the decision model with your project-specific example. So you walk them through it comparing the current business rules practices with what the future would look like if you were using the decision model. And then part five is a wrap-up, aiming to leave them you know, wanting to know more or wanting to see more because part, the very end talks about there's very little risk and very little soft, uh, cost in getting started. Um, we have clients who get started without any new software. We have clients that go straight forward and go for the most sophisticated software all of those clients are successful in general. So, um, so there are many different ways to do this. So let's look at your organization's business rules approach. And I have, to, um, I have to admit that this is a painful part of the presentation for me because I've been doing the business rules approach for many decades now. I even published a book on how best to do it, and many organizations can still follow that book. But the problem is the business rules approach, the way we were doing it, just really didn't work. It didn't hit the mark and there's a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of really smart people and well-meaning people trying to gather business rules in the old way. And the decision model is a rethinking of the problem and also now recognized by the OMG, by the business rule group of, of OMG. So, um, so the, we, <laughs> it's a painful presentation for me to walk through. But it's important for you when you describe your organization's current business rule practices that you assure your audience that your organization is not alone, specifically that their business rule practices are not much different than what everybody else is doing. So no, it's nobody's mistake, it's nobody's fault that they're not doing the latest and greatest because it is the state of the art as of that time. Um, so the next page then, what we say is you should um, talk about um, the, your common advantages that your organization has achieved by capturing business rules separate from other deliverables. And um, these are some of the common advantages, but you should actually you know, talk to people in your organization or even in the presentation and say, what are the good things about what we're doing? Um, for example, they may, they may say that your business rules approach aims to separate business rules from process models and use cases. And they may say it's really good because business rule capture involves business people and they provide and explain the rules, so that's very nice. Um, they might say that the business rules are stored in existing software tools, so maybe they put them in requirements tools, so they, ha they don't have to buy new software for what they're doing, or modeling tools. Or they just use Word documents and spreadsheets, and that's fine. They don't need any special software. And fourth, they might say that they automate the business rules in special uh, software called business rule management systems, like the um, from IBM or, or from Oracle or from other companies, so they have technology specific target for the business rules. So these are all the good things about current approaches and previous approaches. They recognize that business rules are important to an organization and that they actually come from the business. They should actually be owned and governed by the business. So um, let's take a look at some, what the, some of the business rules approaches or most of them look like. So typically Step one is to capture input from subject matter experts. So business analysts or business rule analysts start to capture business input during requirements, but often continue into testing, as we'll talk a little bit about. And usually the next thing is to 
translate the business input in whatever way they give it to you meticulously into more precise textual statements or special syntax or as a subtype of a requirement. So there's a translation step. Um, then step three involves programmers who now then translate that textual representation into executable code for a target environment. And the first thing they're going to do after that is start to test that code. So the next step then, business people actually test the code. And as most of us know, that's when they start to find errors. What the decision model does, and hopefully you realize this in a few min minutes, is it moves all of this up front. By the time you've actually had programmers code make the program code, it's very late in the life cycle to be finding errors. But the decision model helps you find errors right up front. So it is the only way we know today to take requirements-based business rules that business people can understand and actually generate code and test them with, without going to actual code, without involving programmers. So that's one thing I want you to keep in mind. But then typically what happens in your current approaches, if you find errors, there's rework, right? So business experts and business analysts and developers participate in the rework. Um, and some people call this the never-ending step. And, and not only that, it costs, you know, it costs money and time in the rework. And that's because it's too late. It's too late in the life cycle. And so the cycle goes. Often future changes, though, in business rules and policies are made directly to automated code. And what, that loses forever the original business input. And um, what I want to give you a heads up with the decision model is in our clients that are using the decision model, where they just ha if they have it just in Excel spreadsheets in Visio, or they have it in a Sapiens decision repository, all future changes are made to the decision model representation. Nobody in those organizations goes directly to automated code anymore to make changes. What that means is that these decision models are not just requirements deliverables. They're living business artifacts. And the business people are the ones that look at them, validate them, generate test cases, test them, and say, that's the way I want it to be. Um, so, so, um, so in our the next part of your presentation, after you've gone through these um, disadvantages and the translation and, and trying to estimate, right? So a lot of people say some of the problems, one of the problems is they never know um, how long it's going to take um, to translate and to test. And um, they don't know how far they are in the process. They don't know if they've captured 50% of the business rules or 20% or 100%. And they don't even really know when they're finished. With the decision model, you know exactly where you are, and you know exactly how, how far you have to go to finish. And I'll show you that, too. And another thing that happens, too, when you're doing traditional business rules approach is despite the fact that you've separated the business rules from the process models, as shown in this um, page, um, the process models remain complex. They don't become any simpler because you have all these notations for individual or groups of business rules. So separating the rules, which is what I wrote my first business rule book about, turns out not to be enough. It's not enough. We need to do more than that. Business rules, we have found, do not attract the management and attention it deserves. In other words, everybody talks like business rules are important. But high-level management doesn't get excited over individual business rules. They're at too low a level to represent their true importance. Um, so they are actually invisible to management almost from the very beginning. But when we do a decision model approach, we identify these high-level decisions that are driving a business process. Let's say uh, whether you qualify for um, a new mortgage modification program. You want to know that from your banker. Well, that decision, that decision has a lot of rules to it. But the, with a decision model, you're actually managing the decision. That decision has return on investment associated with it. It has risk associated with it. It has benefit associated with it as a whole. And then you basically do a top down. Let's start with the business decision we're looking at. Let's understand how critical it is to the business. And now let's fill in the details in a model format. That gets a lot higher management attention. And even with business rule engines, by the way, we're not, and by the way, we're, you don't have to get rid of your business rule engines if you're doing the decision model. The decision model um, can generate code, or the software can generate code to um, vet different business rule engines, or to Java, 
Uh, so there, it's technology independent. But even with the business rule engines that you have, with your business rules approach, your business rules probably are difficult to change and most often require IT to do that changing. And so the business loses control of them. And uh, the decision model, as I've said, is where the business people go. They, it's where they go to make the changes and to simulate and then to decide that this change is ready to go. So with a traditional business rules approach, the gap between business and IT remains an impediment to business government governance and even to agility. That 90% number that Freddie Mac said was because the business people, the risk managers, the mortgage experts, um, the compliance people were the ones who were in charge of the policy changes and they were able to validate and test before it went to IT. That's that 90% that was closed up there. Um, so we know the rework is often extensive and costly. We know that um, some business rules are not captured at all, or they're captured in the data model, or they're captured in different notes, and so that's, um, that's another disadvantage. So, so what you've done is you've talked about how the decision model has been used elsewhere and how it is a standard. You've looked at the pluses and minuses of your organization's business rules approach, um, and now you're going to explain the decision model, um, but I'm just going to go over this quickly because uh, you can look, take a look at our book, Chapter 2, or some of the white papers on our website. But the point is that the decision model fills a gap that has not been filled successfully by existing pr approaches. And now that the OMG has recognized that gap and endorsed decision modeling, it's even easier to talk about the decision model. Um, we introduced it in our book in 2009, and it has three parts to it. And you're going to see the three parts. It has a business-friendly diagram, a structural diagram. It has um, detailed rules inside. Um, those detailed rules are in two-dimensional tables called rule families. And the third piece is often overlooked, and that is a business-friendly glossary. We allow business people to specify the names of the data, the pieces of data that they use, the way they want to name them, the way they want to define them. They don't have to be concerned with how they're stored in the database. And they can write their um, their logic inside their decision models in their terminology. And the correlation to data sources happens later. It can happen at the same time, but we don't slow the business people down um, by saying, wait a minute, we have to go check and see if we have this and what it looks like and if we have to join tables together. We don't even go there. Okay, we just look at the logic and they write it the way they want to write it. So there's absolutely nothing technical in a decision model. So business people can and do create and interpret and change it without technical assistance. Um, of course, with special software, they can do even more than that. So, so those are the things to talk about. So now let's take a look at to a decision model example that you can create. So we'll use a fictitious example. So you should use your own example. It doesn't need to be a big one. Um, it can be small. And you're not going to develop the entire decision model necessarily. So the idea is to lead your audience through the following a current business process model, current business rule capture related to that model, then look at your created decision model diagram and your rule families and your glossary, and then revisit the process. So here is a, an example of a business process model relating to a traditional business rules approach. This exists in our book. You've seen this in our book. This is actually a process model from a real client, and I think some of you might even be in this webinar. Um, so. Basically, we've separated business rules by putting these little notations here and storing the business rules someplace else. So um, the process model remains complex, and we have our business rules in maybe different places or different ways of representing them. But the next step is to share some real business rules in whatever format your organization manages them. So the most common format is in a business rule spreadsheet. Um, we've seen all different kinds, and this example includes some of the common pieces. So actually, this example is pretty nice compared to what most people see out there. This business rule spreadsheet contains a rule number, a rule text that isn't even in special grammar, but that's okay if it's understandable. It has a rule group. We're going to group them into different groups, and it has the result produced by each rule. And um, we have introduced some inconsistencies or uh, un, unoptimal or suboptimal practices 
um, and you might do the same. So you'll organize your business rules and point out some things that are kind of like not, um, not ideal. So let's take a look at this same sheet. If we look at this one, we see that rules number 537 and 1024 are written in an if-then format, um, but rule number 543 is written in a when X format. Um, so now this seems like it's not all that important, um, but you add that to some of the other suboptimal practices that we're going to find. Here are some, here's some of them. Rule number 491 is actually more than one rule because it's got an and in the word. So one of the things we do when we create decision models, we, get rid, we make sure that we separate sentences and input into very atomic rules following the principles of the decision model. Rule number uh, 1024 at the bottom of the screen also represents more than one rule because it's got the word otherwise. And you're supposed to figure out what the otherwise means. We would say, well, that's two different rules. There's the first rule, and then there's the second one. And we would write the second one in a rule family format in its entirety and make sure that we got it correct. So you may have some of these practices. You may have worse. You may have um, fewer uh, suboptimal practices. But um, I would probably tend to believe that the capture and maintenance of your business rules are, is still error prone. So for the next step now, you're going to introduce the audience to a decision model diagram based on some of the rules you just showed them in a spreadsheet. So this page shows a rule family table. We have a decision model started up here in the diagram. We have an octagon that says we are determining the renewal method for a policy, and we have these structures in here. We'll look at that in a minute. But each of these structures is a rule family where we have conditions, you see at the bottom, we have policy tier and policy discount as conditions, and we have a conclusion. You can also tie the individual business rules from your spreadsheet to the row or rows in the rule family where you represented them. But it is important to point out, um, once you create the rows in the rule family table, there is no need for the business rule spreadsheet anymore. The good news is that the audience is about to see how nicely organized these rules are, because you can't really tell right now, but I'm going to show you how to show that to them. So right now, we look at this decision model diagram, and we see that we have a branch that's coming off on the left-hand side. And actually, if you know how to read a decision model, there will also be one on the right-hand side, because we have these two conditions between the solid line and dotted line in the top green rule family. But once Let's look ahead. We can continue that branch. So we're going to take this branch here, policy pricing within bounds. And if you know how to read this diagram, you know the policy discount, because it's between the solid line and the dotted line, will have its own rule family table. And so this is what happens. We expand the left branch until for policy discount, and we have all of the condition inputs are below the dotted line. That means we have no more logic. They are all raw data. When you reach a level where everything in the decision model is raw data, you're finished. So that's the way you get a handle on how long it's going to take you to finish this decision model. So at this point, we'll walk through um, the audience, the activity of adding the other logic branch. So here we have on the left the policy tier within bounds, but now we want to add the policy underwriting risk branch. So let's take a look at how you're going to walk your audience through this. Um, we can either look at our business rule spreadsheet for all of the business rules that deal with policy underwriting risk or work directly with underwriters. And let's just see if we can fill this in. So suppose in our conversations or looking at the rules, we learn that this risk considers a couple of things. It considers whether the policyholder has had any changes that might increase their risk. And we say, well, what kind of changes? They say, well, if they've changed location, maybe they've moved to a hurricane zone. If they've changed ownership, so someone else owns or has a majority ownership. So um, on the next page, here we have our policy underwriting risk on the right-hand side, and we have major ownership change and major location change. And we, again, ask them what kind of conditions go into here. And since all of these are below this dotted line, we know that all, all the data comes to us from raw data, and this entire decision model is now complete. And maybe this took a couple of hours um, to actually create it, or, um, or, or even longer, but in the conversation in this presentation, it only takes a few minutes. But here's an effective technique that we, I kind of stole from some of our clients. 
You can label the branches in your decision model as shown here because it helps your audience see that the business rules are now organized in a very nice business related way. Not randomly on a spreadsheet and not randomly organized into groups. So here we have a branch for whether a policy tier is acceptable or not within bounds. Um, and we have another one specifically for policy underwriting risk. So this is much better organized. They can see it. They can see the structure. They don't even have to see the details. So this is actually a real one. Okay, So here's a more complex real world decision model based on um, a, a scenario from the United Kingdom. It represents the decision to determine eligibility for disabled student allowances. So see how nicely the call outs um, organize the branches into undergraduate and postgraduate and different kinds of disabilities. There's a branch down here for physical disability. Here's a branch for mental health disability. Here's a branch for learning different eligibility, all bubbling up to disability, disabled students and all the way up to the very top. So this is a very powerful way to bring your business sponsors into the decision model and say, do you think this is easier to understand than the business rule spreadsheet? that we showed you before. Now the piece we overlook a lot is the glossary. But I mentioned it already and it's important to introduce the business glossary for this decision model you just did because it reinforces for your business audience that it contains their names, their definitions, and a full set of values that they want to use. And so they, as they build their decision model, they're going to be entering those column headings into their glossary and it belongs to them. Okay, it's what they call them and what, how they know it. Um, there is no, absolutely no need in most cases for you to create object models or data models or fact models prior to creating a decision model. Now that's not to say that you might not need those things to automate them, but you don't need them to build the decision model for the business audience. Those things are needed when you deploy. Okay, so we don't have to slow everything down. So, What's important is the business glossary is the glue that connects the business audience to the technical audience because the business audience creates the business logic or validates it while the technical audience worries about its automation. So when a decision model is targeted for automation, a technical professional will cross-reference two data models or databases, all of the fact, we call them fact types, all of these column headings that are in a decision model. And, um, and this can happen after the business specifies and tests the logic. If you're using savings decision, you can test and generate test cases without having any object model or data model. It simply uses the glossary and your rule family tables to generate test cases, and it runs them. So then at this point, you want to go back to the process model and, and that you started with and said, well, if I created, recreated that process model, and show decision models in it, I can simplify the process model and I can show you exactly the task that has the decision model in it that I just showed you. So now you get the connection. You've got the decision model and the glossary and the decision model anchors to a much simpler process model. So um, you'll notice that all of the business rule pointers in the original process model are gone and any change in business rules, don't ha they're, they typically don't need a change in the process model. They might need a rule change in the decision model. You go into the decision model, look at the rule families, make the change, validate against principles, generate test cases and test. And that can be done separate from the process model and even separate from IT doing the automation. So um, at this point, you'll want to summarize the benefits and ask for questions from your audience. And um, here you might want to talk about other ways that organizations are using decision models. And there's a wide range of uses indicates that every organization can find many uses for decision models. They've been used for compliance decisions, including Basel III. They've been used for eligibility decisions, including the HAMP and the HARP program, you know, mortgage refis and mortgage modifications. Policy changes, obviously, in the face of disasters. They've been used for general business logic, such as making claim claim payments, determining membership in the new health care plans, as well as those policies change. Um, and they've been also used recently, not long ago, for underwriting logic and risk logic for defaulting assets. And it's very heavily used for data quality logic, and that's a whole other topic, but our clients are creating decision models to make sure that the data is of highest quality before a decision model uses it. 
So in your wrap-up then, remind the audience of the original process model, like the one shown here, and the different kinds of business rule spreadsheets, as shown on the right. And this is what your organization is currently doing. And then you remind them, well, let's reintroduce the changes. So when I click here, I will change my original process model with a nicer process model. I can put my decision model in the middle. Um, I get rid of those spreadsheets. Um, I can store this in something like Sapiens Decision, which is a business decision management system, or I can store them in you know, Word or Excel. I can still keep my legacy code in my business rule engine if I want to. Um, in some cases, you can regenerate the code following the decision model. So it's up to you. We do not, you do not have to throw away your current business rule engine just because you want to use the decision model. A lot of our, organ our clients want to create the decision models and deploy to multiple engines or to test one engine versus another. So the decision model is independent of the engine, but you don't have to get rid of your engines if you want to keep them. So um, you might be thinking that the creation of these decision models takes a lot of time. But you would be very incorrect, and this is a surprise to us. The productivity numbers of creating decision models over previous approaches have astounded even us. So let's see a real world example, and you can use this one too in your presentation. Um, this page contains productivity statistics for a real world a uh, project in a major organization where that organization has several years of decision modeling experience. And the top bar is how, how long it took them to do business rules, their traditional approach. So you would fill that in with your approach, or you could use this as an example. So they created 50 rules in six weeks. The second line here, all they did was they added the decision model with Visio and Excel. They did not introduce any new technology, and they were able to put in 80 rules or 80 rule changes in only four weeks. And then eventually when they got to the savings decision, they could do 500 rules in three weeks because so much, so much of this is automated. Um, finding the logic errors is at a push of a button. Generating test cases and testing all happens within the software. So all these tasks here are gen are automated. So that's where the productivity comes from. So at this point, you might want to indicate to your audience in your words that there's really um, not much to lose to try it. The decision model delivers business logic and rules as a living business asset governed by business people. Um, it replaces current business rules approaches. There are no risks. You don't have to buy new software if you just want to try it with our Excel and Visio templates that are free from our website. Um, and, and we mentioned that here there are not that many risks. If, of course, if you try new software, you know, you'll get some risks in new software, but you get a lot of benefits. Um, and the decision model fills a gap that has never before been filled successfully. So um, now, at this point in your presentation, you go back to what they said the advantages and disadvantages were of their approach, and then check off the disadvantages and see if they have gone away. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Michael Gross to tell you how you can learn some more. Thank you, Barbara. This was a very insightful presentation. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I just would like to draw the attention to some areas where the audience can learn more. Uh, definitely vis visit our uh, website, www.kpiusa.com. You will uh, have access to a free primer that is a summary of the essence of the decision model. You will also have um, the opportunity to download white papers uh, to access some of the recordings of our previous webinars, and we will make a recording of this webinar also available at the website. Then uh, please visit uh, Modern Analyst. Uh, Barbara is a contributor. Barbara and Larry are contributors to the Modern Analyst uh, for many, many years. Uh, some of the articles are now in the 8,000 uh, plus uh, category in terms of people that read them. Uh, they're very popular, and you will find a whole series of different uh, articles related to the decision model, like the decision model and VP men decision model and uh, business rules, so I highly recommend to do that. And of course, read the book. Uh, the book is available uh, as a Kindle version on Amazon or as a hardcover. Uh, we are not publishing the book. The book is pu published by uh, Francis and Taylor, uh, so uh, as, as such, we are not selling the book directly, just that you know. 
Uh, if you would like to reach out to our ecosystem, the best way to do that is to become a part of our decision model group at LinkedIn. Uh, we have two groups there. One is the decision model group and the other one is the decision model news group. The difference is the decision model group is a closed group for uh, practitioners, uh, experts that are exchanging their, um, their information and I try to stay away as much as possible with uh, marketing information. Uh, the decision model news group is uh, more a marketing orient oriented uh, a group where we make more marketing related announcements. Then uh, please uh, save the day uh, every second Thursday in a month. We will have a webinar um, and uh, you will receive an email uh, from us shortly with the, um, the lineup of, of the topics. We are just in the final round of finalizing the topics for this year. Uh, and most importantly, if you want to um, become a decision modeler, your best chance or the best first step is to attend the decision model essential training with Barbara von Halle. Uh, it will take place next January, uh, next, next, uh, in January, 21st to 23rd. Um, the, the training is an online training. It takes place from 9.30 to 12.30 uh, Eastern uh, Standard now. Uh, the, yeah, it's not daylight savings yet. So it's Eastern Standard Time uh, and uh, that should give uh, everybody a chance to attend that, uh, people from uh, the, uh, Europe but also in the US. And please feel free to contact us. Uh, here is the telephone number. Uh, you also can send us emails. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, showing up to this first uh, uh, webinar in this year and uh, we hope to see you to many more and uh, if you have some questions, uh, this is the time now. I would like to open the, uh, uh, the podium for our Q&A. So uh, in order to participate, please uh, take advantage of the chat function here. And I have a first question coming in. And this question is uh, from uh, an uh, attendee in Minnesota. How does DMN relate to this uh, KPI's decision model? Um, okay, uh, that's a question that we're going to get a lot uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, historically, it was the decision model that actually instigated DMN. But the, and the goals are different. DMN is aiming for, to be a business-friendly representation of decision, decision models, but most of the team was a technical team. So the emphasis on the, in the document, if you read the document, is on interchangeability, meta model, and even some language, programming language type of things. But from a standard, so from a standard committee, from the, what we're, we're looking at in our clients, um, DMN is really not a decision model. It's called decision model and notation. It is a diagramming technique. And it is a diagramming technique that is general, so it includes lots of things in the diagram. Um, so um, it's not as specific as the decision model. Like we have the rule family tables you saw. Um, we have specific principles about how you fill in those tables. The DMN is very lax in how you fill in the logic. You can even have logic in a Java format. Um, or you can have it in a decision table or, or decision tree or, or many different forms. But they want to pull them all together in one diagram. Um, so the, the decision model is more rigorous. That's why we can generate test cases. That's why we can validate the logic that's in it. Um, but we will work with clients. We are interested in using lots, some of the aspects of DMN in order to have a more general look and feel that you can then drill down into the rigor of the decision model. So they are different. They have some similar goals and different goals. Um, we will adopt as much of DMN as we can without sacrificing the success that we've had. And we will use our clients as, as an, um, a measurement of what things are useful um, and what things are not useful. So um, we, we would like to be able to exchange, bring in DMN models into a decision model format as much as we can um, and continue to evolve them there. So they, they are not exactly the same, uh, but they hopefully will work interchangeably with each other. Barbara, do we have another question coming in? And that is regarding uh, the, the difference in selling to IT and, and business. Is there a difference and if, if there if there is one, what, what is to, 
what people have to recognize there. Okay, that's a really good question too because we find we find there are two distinct um, audiences, right? There's the technical audience, which typically is the enterprise architects. So if you're t um, selling decision modeling and approach to enterprise architects or technology people, they are most likely interested in software that supports decision modeling and how it fits into their enterprise architecture and, and, and which includes their business role engines and things like that. So, so it's important to understand the technical ramifications of doing decision modeling in, in a new kind of software. The other side is, uh, so you can come technology first and, and then decision model second. For the business audiences, they seem most interested in knowing that the notation is simple to understand and that they can create and validate it even th possibly themselves. And even if they can't create it, they can understand it. And they, they're interested in the fact that they could potentially, with software, go all the way through to testing before they turn their decision models over to IT. So the business people are really more into the functionality and advantages of the decision models and the um, technical group is more interested in the, you know, how that technology fits into our whole technology infrastructure. Um, so it is slightly different. It's best when you bring them both together. All right, and uh, I got an, another question in there that is more um, sales orientated. And uh, the question is how, uh, whether we can ha give an example how uh, a decision, the decision model was introduced to a company. And I, I, can, I can take that very quickly. Um, okay. Because it's, um, I think what we should uh, explain, we are uh, supporting the, the, the in, inside team. So that means uh, if, if you're interested in a decision model, please reach out to us. As mentioned, we are providing lunch and learns. They are uh, free. So if you f feel that this makes sense, uh, we are more than happy to have a private uh, a webinar for you. And then typically the next step is to have a lunch and learn. At a lunch and learn, we would take an example from you um, to exemplify how a particular problem can be solved with the, with the help of the decision model. And that typically is presented to a mixed audience of uh, the business and, uh, and IT folks. And uh, in most cases, that results in, uh, in an additional next step where uh, the business typically reaches out to us and asks for a proof of concept because they want to see how it works or in some cases, a pilot project. In a pilot project, we would train uh, the client's team so that they become uh, more familiar with the, the decision model and then work with them on a more comprehensive example or a real project and uh, have then um, uh, an estimate for what we call the target project, right? Um, typically, we, we work in Agile, uh, so that's also an added benefit if, if you are interested in, in embracing Agile, but that's not, it's, it's not a mandatory, it's what we do uh, preferably, but uh, we are also working in uh, waterfall environments. And then once you have uh, the first project under your belt, you become more and more independent. You uh, will have multiple projects typically in a company. And then the, the, the next step that we are now observing with our clients is the need for a center of excellence because once you have five, six, seven projects happening at the same time, there are questions about governance, there are questions about you know, managing best practices, and uh, we are uh, helping these clients to succeed in uh, establishing either a center of excellence or a center of competence. Um, now, uh, after that, uh, we, 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 we would be superficial. We, you don't need us anymore at, uh, at the client side, but uh, we can help you with mentoring uh, uh, and uh, also reviews. And of course, we have a very comprehensive certification program for people that are working in, in the project. Certification is quite tough. There are not too many decision modelers that are certified by KPI but they are very sought in the industry right now because they represent, uh, they represent and they have a new skill set um, that is very valuable for their employers. So uh, that's just a quick answer. <laughs> it's not a quick answer, but the answer to the question. Um, then uh, there, is, there is another one. Are there um, words of wisdom for socializing the decision model within an organization, Barbara? That's most likely something that you want to take. 
Um, Okay, uh, there are different ways you can do that. Um, some of our clients will host a lunch and learn, um, like or an online meeting, and um, you might have a group of you that have built some little decision models, even you know, or um, not using in a project, but just as an example of how it might be different. And having a lunch and learn, um, if you are actually, if you actually have, um, you're involved in a decision model project, and you want to other, you know, advertise your successes. What we do a lot of times at our client sites, we say they have like weekly validation meetings where the business SMEs come and look at the, they put the decision models up on a screen, whether it's in software or whatever, and, and explain the decision models they've done or the changes that they've made, but they invite other, other people from other projects um, for IT and business to come into the validation sessions, and so they can see the progress week by week um, in terms of how real decision models are getting done within the organization. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, socializing it um, just, you know, on napkins, so to speak, and talk to different people and say, look, if I did it this way, how about if I did it that way, um, and then see if uh, the, the decision model deliverables can be substituted for what you're doing for the previous one. Um, but Michael, I see one more. I know we're almost out of time. I see a qu question here that comes up all the time. Um, what is the difference between a business rules and decision um, and, the, and the decision model. And um, business rules, since I grew up in the business rules space, uh, business rules generally are, um, sometimes it, it, business rules mean a lot of things to a lot of people. The difference is if we take a business rule as someone wrote it in text and convert it to rule family format, we have to convert it to conditions leading to conclusions. We can't just say, um, you know, a person has to have a FICO score greater than 650 to get this mortgage. We'd have to say, well, they have the FICO score, if it's greater than 650, they're eligible, but if it's less than or equal to, they're not eligible, and any other criteria. So we have to convert them all to conditions leading to conclusions because otherwise they're not actionable, and otherwise we can't look for gaps. If we just leave them in sentence format or, or you know, fill in the template, blank templates, we can't find gaps, we can't find overlaps, we can't process it as something that has a shape. Um, so that's the difference between a business rule and, business, and, and what the decision model has. The decision model is a model of logic. We convert anything you say, whether you call it a business rule or something else, to logic, conditions leading to one conclusion. The difference between decision modeling and business rules is decision modeling starts with the decision. I, what, what do I need to be eligible for a mortgage, for this program, mortgage program? And then you start building those branches. You're doing a top-down graphical picture of your decision and you're filling in the details later. That is significantly different than going through and trying to gather up individual business rules in whatever form and putting them in all different groups. It, it's, it's just a top-down business-focused approach. Um, we used to say that we don't replace the business rules approach, but we actually do. We, we replace the business rules approach from the collection and management perspective. We don't have to, you don't have to, you know, replace your business rule engine or your job or whatever, but it's the, the representation is much, much quicker, much more precise, and much more amenable to generating test cases and analyzing and things like that than, than the traditional business rules approach. Barbara, there's one more that I would like to answer quickly, uh, and <clears throat> that is related to reluctance of the IT group when introducing. And um, I just would like to bring an anecdote with that. Uh, we, the, the reluctance of IT is, is not uncommon. It's not the standard, right? But um, you always have to see what the decision model does. It's a model of business logic to help to organize business rules. Now, business rules are typically organized and managed by the IT in their business rules engine. So uh, there is a lot of confusion if, 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 if the business comes and says, well, we have something great for business logic. Uh, in some cases, the IT people are scared that uh, the business will then dictate them what kind of technology they have to use and then make their, uh, their technology platform obsolete, right? Now, nothing is further from the truth, and uh, we have been working with some IT departments that were very reluctant because they thought we want to take their business rules engine away. But once they have realized that we are actually providing the missing link between the requirements and what they are doing with their engines, with their execution engines, they became actually our strongest supporters uh, because 
their biggest challenge today is to make sense of uh, out of the rather amb ambiguous uh, uh, natural text statements that they get as requirements from business to business analysts. And they, they are very excited now of, about the prospect having an input, a natural input from the business analyst that can be used either for coding or, you know, if you use technology like Sapiens uh, Decision uh, to, to automate their, uh, their generation from a uh, rules engine like uh, ODM, um, Drools, uh, Blaze, and, and many others more. So I think it's a way how to uh, communicate and explain it. I think openness is the best way. I think th um, this is a win-win situation for business and IT, and in particular for the business analysts that are in between these uh, two, two areas. And it's just a, a way you, you need to generate an, an environment where you can talk openly with them and explain what's in for each party. Okay, so, Barbara, um, you want to you wanna add to that? Um, no, but I, it's just that it's um, it just it just depends on the politics of the organization. But it's um, the one thing that we will do at KPI and with our um, software partners is we will remain technology independent. Um, I'm not sure you'll see that from some of the other vendors who have you know an investment in their products. So they may create decision modeling tools that generate only for their platform. Um, oh. But you know. We'll, we will remain technology independent and, and because that's what we do. Oh, and there's, there's also an important one, sorry, where we are over the time, but uh, I see we have uh, still some people on. Uh, the question was about technology. So, Barbara, to your point, uh, the DMN, which is, um, is a notation, right, becomes mm -hmm. more and more popular. Um, there's also a question about the proprietariness of, uh, of, 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 of the TDM. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are now two companies in the marketplace that offer um, a solution that is licensed by us, one being Sapiens Decision and the other one is, uh, is, is Biz Design, right? Uh, it is expected to, to have that we have m many more. Um, for, for, for the audience that want to know, you know, what, what kind of uh, 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 ramifications are there if they use the decision model. We have a, a license agreement on, on our website. So basically, if you are a consultant, if you are a company uh, that wants to develop their own uh, software internally and not sell the software, you can use the decision model and anything with it as, as, as you please. If you are a software vendor that wants to sell the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, essence of the decision model, uh, you, you, you would enter a license agreement with us. So as such, uh, for the end users, it's all free. Uh, the only restrictions are at some areas uh, that, that come for uh, software vendors that want to sell the software for, um, for game. Uh, we have also a program for open source software. So. Um, just to point it out, and if you even want to learn more about it, just visit our website. We have all the documentation there. So I think, Barbara, you, you want to add something to that? Or there, there, I see there are many other questions, but I think they, we will not be able to answer all of them uh, on, can, the, on the webinar, right? But we can okay. send We can send, capture them and answer them. They are all captured, and we will follow up with each and every one of them, right? So, and, and that's also, if there is something that comes to you maybe later, just send us an email. Uh, we're more than happy to, uh, to reach out to you and uh, maybe come to your place and uh, uh, show, show you a little more about uh, what's available and what you can do with position modeling. So, I want to wish everybody happy decision modeling and uh, look forward to seeing you. Barbara, you want to close the, the, the webinar for today? Barbara, yeah. Okay, um, it was exciting. This is our first one of 2004. Can you, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Michael? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe I started talking before I unmuted. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I think 2014 is going to be a very interesting year for decision modeling. There is not as much resistance as, as you know, a few years ago. We've been doing this for many years now, and we've seen the technology evolve, and we've seen you can go to different conferences and you can find people who have productivity numbers and successful stories. Um, to draw from, and so it's it's just going to be a, a very exciting year, 2014. And I'm we're we're waiting like everybody else to see what happens to the DMN. Um, we would like it to be as useful as possible without constraining or without making it too technical. That's our our goal is to keep the decision model business friendly, um, and and you know, and we'll let our clients guide the way in, in terms of that. But I think it's going to be a good year for 2000 for the decision model, 2014. Very good. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Goodbye.